Hey, good evening. We're going to talk about Civil War, at least the first part of it tonight. It's a two-part lecture, so um, let's get started with this so I can get you back to what you're doing. Now let's talk about North versus South, a comparison real quick. Um, it's something a lot of people don't sit there and do. They just talk about Civil War, but they don't understand you know, what's going on with the two sides. Northern states, more populous. There are more of them. Um, the northern states, they have a population of 20.7 million, almost 21 million people. Southern states, a little over 9.1 million, but three and a half of that, those uh, million people are slaves and they can't fight. So really that brings you down to, you know, about 5 million people in the southern states. Uh, as far as working goes, uh, the North has a huge advantage in industrial production. The North has 110,000 manufacturing sites that employ 1.3 million workers. Southern states, there's only 18,000 manufacturing sites and 110,000 workers. So the North can outproduce the South very, very drastically. Uh, the North, 22,000 miles of railroad. The South has less than 10,000. Uh, the United States, army exists in the north and in the south they have a strong military tradition there are military schools everywhere and um, the northern states their plan is going to be to outlast and outproduce the south i mean the north can outproduce everything the south does whether it's industrial or agricultural with one exception that one exception is cotton southern states are going to try to outlast and play defense against southern states now looking at these two comparisons, you might be like, well, why does the South think they can win? Well, they're going back and they're looking at the, um, the American Revolution as their, their, um, their goal or their, um, what's the word I'm thinking of, their, uh, their inspiration. Yeah. Uh, they, they see themselves as very much the same as the, uh, the American colonists even though they're, you know, Europe is three months away and, you know, the North is right across the street, so. All right, how long does this war last? Nobody thinks it's gonna last very long. Uh, both sides have a strong leadership. Um, you've got some very famous generals, Robert E. Lee, George McClellan, Stonewall Jackson, Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, there's a guy named General Will Winfred Scott, or Winfield Scott, sorry. Uh, most of the leadership is going to be trained at West Point or they're going to have experience from the Mexican War. And because of the strong leadership, neither side thought the war was going to last long. Uh, when states call for volunteers, they're asking for people to serve for 90 days, 6 months, maybe a year. There's only 2 or 3 states that say, you know, we might need you for 3 years. Uh, as I said, the South wants to play defense, but the long border makes that nearly impossible. They don't have enough people to... Um, to uh, protect everything. It's estimated that at its largest, the Confederate Army was about a million, maybe a million and a half people. Uh, the North wants to play offense, and they come up with something called the Anaconda Plan. And the Anaconda Plan is supposed to squeeze the life out of the Confederacy, and it's broken into three parts. Um, they're gonna blockade the ports, they're gonna shut down the Mississippi River, they're gonna stop all imports and exports, and then they're gonna squeeze it with a until the South pops, basically. Uh, the problem with that is the Anaconda Plan would have been very, very slow, and politicians, they wanted immediate reaction, so the Anaconda Plan uh, is kind of put on the back burner, but it's going to come back and really win the war for the North. Now, who are the Confederate states? Um, it's South Carolina, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, Texas, Virginia, Arkansas, Tennessee, North Carolina. There's also a New Mexico Territory and Indian Territory, also known as Oklahoma, is going to be associated with Confederate states as well. But you can see there, uh, Western Virginia votes to secede from Virginia. Uh, the state of West Virginia is born during the Civil War. Now what about Kentucky, Missouri, and Maryland? All three of those places are slave states. Well, Maryland is placed under martial law by the U.S. Army, and that prevents Maryland from joining the Confederacy. I mean, how would it look if your, your um, national capital, meaning Washington, D.C., is completely surrounded by the enemy? That's not going to go so well. So Maryland's put under martial law. The U.S. Army controls Maryland. Uh, Kentucky is officially neutral. 
In Kentucky, the legislature favors the South, the governor favors the North. Two separate militias are formed, fighting almost breaks out, but right before they can solve their differences through violence, the Confederate army invades, commits violence, and then the government declares for the North because of the Confederate invasion. Uh, if the Confederate army had not invaded, a lot of people think that Kentucky would have joined the South, but uh, their loss was the North's gain. Missouri, um, it's a strong slave state. It had been since the 1820s. It's almost the exact opposite of Kentucky. In Missouri, the legislature favors the North, the governor favors the South. Pro-North and pro-South militias form. They actually do fight each other. And you get like this four or five month long miniature civil war in Missouri. And while Missouri is fighting itself, the US Army is going to invade and take Missouri over. All right, now you have to create an army because an army didn't exist at the time. So um, when war is declared, it's gonna kind of um, take some time for the news to get out. Some people are really excited about it. Some people aren't, it just kind of depends. You know, some of the, the men are you know really excited for it. Some don't want to do it because they're worried about your, their families. Women are excited because whatever reasons, but then a lot of women know that, they're, that their family could die. And then there's also the black slaves. Nobody knows what's going to happen there. So uh, you got to raise the troops and people have to join. And there are a couple different reasons why people join. Some people join to join a cause or they believe in anti-slavery or pro-slavery. Some people think this is their way to become a man. Uh, it's kind of like a rite of passage to go to war. And then there's some people who join for the adventure and for the travel. You know, people have never been away from home before, and here you go. This is how we can get away from home. Mustering troops. This is how you actually recruit the troops. And what would generally happen is prominent citizens in a town or a county would set up recruiting offices. They would recruit in newspapers, word of mouth. They would go to churches. They would go to social gatherings. So basically recruitment through advertisement. And some states even offer money. If you come and fight, we'll pay you money. Um, once enough men are enlisted, a company from that town is formed. Officers are elected. They don't have to be the best off the best people, the best. Like, maybe they have previous military experience. They're not necessarily going to become the officers. Generally speaking, the officers are going to be those same prominent people who recruited you because you elect your officers. But once the company is formed, once the officers are elected, then your company is mustered into service. So you would have maybe the 1st Carrollton Regiment, or the 1st Noonan Regiment, or the, the 2nd LaGrange Re Regiment, whatever it might be. All the people from that community are going to serve together at the beginning. Once you have a company, you have to give the company supplies. So you end up with gear being supplied by individual communities or states and there's a big problem with this I mean there is kind of corruption uh, also there's confusion because if the state of Georgia if LaGrange issues and makes different uniforms than say Auburn Alabama even though those two cities aren't that far together you got a problem there were even some Confederate troops who show up for training wearing blue uniforms instead of gray uniforms. So the uniforms don't always match and it causes a lot of confusion. After that you have to train the troops and the, the uh, troops go to state training camps. So Georgia soldiers are trained separately from South Carolina soldiers. South Carolina soldiers are trained separately from Tennessee soldiers. So they're not all trained to the same level and it's really hard for different state troops to work together because their trainings are different. Uh, it's also really hard for people to adjust to military life. For some, they've never been away from home before. Uh, for others, they can't adjust the military discipline. And the idea of military drill is a foreign thing, even to the officers, because nobody's done it. All right, the first battle. Before I do the first battle, here's your word of the day. Today's word of the day is grass, G-R-A-S-S. -S. And the reason your word of the day is grass is quite simply, I mowed my grass today. So your secret word of the day is grass. Okay, so the first battle is known as Manassas, or the first battle of Bull Run. 
It happens on July 21st, 1861 in Manassas, Virginia. Today is a suburb of Washington, D.C. It's only 30 miles away from the, the, the state capital, or national capital, if you will. The Union Army is led by a guy named General Urban McDowell. He's got about 35,000 soldiers. The Confederate Army is led by P.G.T. Beauregard. Uh, Pierre Gustave Toussaint Beauregard. That's a proper southern name, I believe. So that's P.G.T. or Pierre Gustave Toussaint Beauregard. He's got about 32,000 soldiers. So this battle happens, and it's crazy. There were actually spectators there with picnic lunches thinking that this was going to be the only battle of the, the war. And um, the morning battles are won by the Union. Uh, the Confederates are almost pushed to retreat. But then in the afternoon, there are reinforcements brought in by the Confederacy, and they are going to win the afternoon battle. And the Union troops are going to basically turn around, run off the battlefield, and they're not going to stop running until they get to Washington, D.C. Uh, the Confederate troops, they don't follow the Union Army because they're just so disorganized. But there really was a chance that that could have been the only battle of the war if the Confederate troops had been able to march the 30 miles and make it to Washington, D.C. Well, after the battle, there's panic in the north as people are really worried. They're like, oh my god, we didn't expect to lose that battle. Um, what are we going to do? Uh, thousands of people volunteer to serve in the army. And in the south, they basically think the war is over. Um, the people, southern ministers say that, you know, this is like the second parting of the Red Sea. The victory was God's will, etc., etc. Um... Irvin McDowell is relieved of duty, and a guy named George McClellan is going to take over the army. And uh, George McClellan is really going to start training the U.S. Army into the army that's going to win the war. Now, there's also uh, some naval victories that happened very early in the war by the North. Remember, that's part of the Anaconda Plan, is to take control of the, the seas, if you will. Well, in November of 1861, Port Royal, South Carolina is captured. Uh, that's near Hilton Head, if you've ever been there, or Paris Island, if you have anybody that's in the, the Marine Corps in the family. And Port Royal is going to become the main base for the Union Navy in the South. Um, also, in April of 1862, Fort Pulaski, which is right outside Savannah, is going to fall to Union forces. If you have ever been to Savannah and you've driven to Tybee Island, Fort Pulaski is that fort that's off to the left when you're almost to Tybee Island. And that's important because it guards the Savannah River and it kept Savannah and Georgia and South Carolina safe. Well, Fort Pulaski falls and Savannah is going to be endangered. Then um, the Union Navy is also going to take New Orleans in April of 1862. That's, of course, where the Mississippi River is, and that's going to stop the Mississippi River from being usable by the Confederacy. All right, one of the most it's one of the most famous battles of all modern naval history is the USS Monitor versus the Confederate uh, ship Merrimack, and these are what are called ironclads. They're they're ships that are that are uh, covered in iron, and it's the first time that iron and armor is put on ships. While the ship ends in a draw, it's going to change naval warfare forever. There was a British observer watching this battle happen and seeing how powerful these iron ships were. This British observer goes back to England and all of the orders for wooden ships in England are canceled and England starts to begin um, the development and building of a metal navy because of this battle. And um, also with these northern naval victories the blockade begins to work. I mean the city of Richmond is cut off from the sea, Charleston is cut off from the sea, so is Savannah, Pensacola, New Orleans, in fact, the only two ports that are left open are Wilmington, North Carolina, and Mobile, Alabama. And those are the only two places where the South can get stuff in from foreign countries. All right, Tennessee in 1862. Uh, 
Tennessee River and the, um, what's it called, the uh, Cumberland River are going to flow very close and into even Nashville. And there's a plan that's developed to take advantage of these rivers. Uh, the Confederate Army is going to invade Kentucky, and in 1864, Tennessee is going to be very poorly defended. So Ulysses S. Grant is going to come up with this plan of sailing down the Mississippi River and then going into the Tennessee River and then surprising uh, Tennessee with an attack. And there are two forts that protect Nashville. There's Fort Donaldson that's on the Cumberland River. There's Fort Henry on the Tennessee River. They're National Historic Sites today, so if you ever drive up towards Nashville, you can go visit these. Well, Fort Donaldson is going to fall to the Union on, um, what is it, it's uh, February, I think it's February 6th for Fort Henry, and it's February 16th, I believe it is, for Fort Donaldson, and the city of Nashville is completely unprotected, and Nashville is going to surrender on February 25th. So we are only a couple months into the war and the Nashville's already fallen to the Union. Uh, because of that, Kentucky is abandoned by the Confederate Army. They rush to protect themselves and they're going to meet again outside of Savannah, Tennessee, which is kind of South Central Tennessee. And the Battle of Shiloh is going to occur on March 17th of, 19, or of 1862. Now the Battle of Shiloh is important because it is one of the bloodiest days in American history. The Battle of Shiloh on March 17th of 1862, there are 23,000 casualties. 12,000 casualties for the Union, 11,000 casualties for the Confederacy, and that is more than the previous three wars the U.S. had fought combined. So in one day, the U.S. has more casualties than in any war the U.S. had fought previously, all the way back to the American Revolution. All right, let's look at Virginia. Uh, in Virginia in 1862, the Union, they've got control of a place called Fort Monroe. It's a, it was a fort near Norfolk, Virginia, or Hampton Roads, if you've ever been there. And there are over 100,000 soldiers there and 300 cannons. Uh, George McClellan is going to plan on launching an attack from Fort Monroe, which is near you know, Norfolk, Newport News, Hampton Roads, that area of Virginia. And they're going to try and take out the city of Richmond, which was the southern capital. Well, on the Confederate side, you've got a general named Joseph E. Johnston and a general named Stonewall Jackson. All total, the Confederacy has about 70,000 men, so they're outnumbered. Well, this attack begins on May 31st, 1862. It's going to last all the way till June 30th of 1862. There are numerous battles that happen during what becomes known as the Peninsula Campaign. And Joseph E. Johnston is going to be injured during this, and a guy named Robert E. Lee will become the lead general for the Confederate States because Joseph Johnston is injured. By the time this... this... Um, set of battles is over, there are 35,000 plus casualties. The Confederacy suffers about 20,000 losses and the, the, uh, the Union suffers about 16 and a half thousand. So this, uh, in Virginia, the war is not going very well for either side. And then you got the high point of Confederacy. For a lot of historians who study and write about the Civil War, they say that the fall of 1862 is the best chance of a Confederate victory. It's when the Confederates are at their most powerful. Um, the Confederacy launches two offenses simultaneously. Robert E. Lee invades Maryland, and a guy named Braxton Bragg invades Kentucky. Um, Lee is going to invade Maryland because if Lee wins in Maryland, uh, he, the South might get recognized by France and Britain, and there's also the chance that Maryland's going to join the Confederacy. Both of those would be big wins for the uh, Confederate states. And in, in Kentucky's case, uh, the goal there is to get Kentucky to join the Confederacy willingly this time and to get the Union forces out of Tennessee. Now, never again is the South going to be this powerful. Never again is the South going to be able to launch two different offenses like this 
And for a lot of people, this is the turning point of the war when these two invasions fail. All right, just a quick note before I let you go. Um, the final exam is going to be put up on Monday of next week. Uh, however, there will be one last day of lecture on Tuesday. So uh, while the final exam will be up on Monday, I highly suggest you don't take it until you see next Tuesday's video. But uh, that's it for now. Uh, keep working on your SLOs. Uh, start working on and getting those museum reviews in. And as always, any questions, just send me an email. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.